Thanks everybody for coming out tonight on a almost spring night. And I just want to throw this out to anybody. If you're at all interested in getting more involved in the society, if you're already a member, if you want to be a member, you can join. Um, it's $10 for individuals and 18 for families um, per year. Um, if you want to go beyond that and, and be on the board, it's uh, a handful of meetings a year and you can get involved you know, however much you want. But we would love to get some new people um, kind of getting their hands dirty on, on 18th and 19th and 20th century dust that we have in our collections. Um, it's a pretty fun place. It's a great group of people and there's a lot to work with. Um, there's exhibitions to put together and we're doing a catalog cataloging project um, that takes a lot of people to be involved in. If you have any interest in that and want to get more involved, please see me after the talk. So that brings us to tonight's speaker. Um, and I'm happy to report he's John Wilson. Um, John received uh, both his BA and his MA degrees in anthropological archaeology at UMass Amherst. Uh, he was employed for 10 years as New England Division Archaeologist in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, then for 26 years as Senior Regional Archaeologist for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, most recently, John assisted doc Dr. Kevin McBride and staff of the um, Mashantucket Pequot Museum in military history aspects of their Falls Fight Battlefield project. In 2014, John received a prestigious Secretary of the Interior's Award for Historic Preservation. Um, and we're honored to have him here tonight to tell us, to, to give us an archaeologist um, view of the uh, 1676 Falls Fight. So thank you, John. Warm welcome. Strangely enough, I'm going to start with acknowledgments and a disclaimer <laughs> as part of the acknowledgments. My role in this was relatively minor compared to a lot of other people. Anyway, this was really a collaborative effort between a lot of people. Um, myself, Dr. Peter Thomas, University of Vermont retired, who happens to be sitting here in the audience. Dr. Kevin McBride is really the key individual figure. He's uh, the archaeologist from the Mashantucket Pequot Museum also a professor at University of Connecticut, and uh, his museum staff really directed all the field work on this. I, I had, strangely enough, I had nothing to do with the field work, despite being an archaeologist. I just walked over with, uh, walked over the landscape a couple of times, uh, along with Pete Thomas and Dr. McBride, uh, you know, providing our two, two, two or three cents worth on uh, the terrain and the tactics that the English used versus the tactics that the indigenous people used and how we thought it all played out. Um, there, were also, there was also considerable input from local volunteers, uh, representatives of several indigenous nations, and uh, volunteers, particularly metal detectors volunteers working under Dr. McGuire's <coughs> supervision. Um, it was all funded by the National I wasn't funded, I did it pro bono, <laughs> my part, but it was funded by grants from the National Park Service and the American Battlefield Protection Program, which is really a great program for battlefields all across America and other types of historic military sites. Um, special, I want to give special thanks to Dr. McBride because he allowed me to use uh, a lot of images from the report, the latest report. And uh, a lot of those are maps, then it's hard to follow what's going on without the maps. Otherwise, it would just look like a huge mess I had. Um, my personal contribution was editorial commentary and an appendix to the report that described the history and personnel of both uh, William Turner's company of foot, that was the one he originally raised, and his later and much larger garrison company. Um, that work was in turn based upon my own analysis of published historic documents, including transcribed military pay records, period nar narratives, and a lot of reading of 17th century uh, tactical manuals, uh, which is pretty heavy going, <laughs> by the way, particularly given that it's written in 17th century English. Uh, <laughs> any errors and misinterpretations are strictly my own, uh, not the blame of anyone else. Anyway, I will now start off. Um, an archaeologist, at least this archaeologist, view of the false fight. May 19, 1676. 
most archaeology looks at pretty small areas of, of land uh, that were often continuously occupied by generations of people over the course of many years, decades, or even <coughs> centuries. Here you see a couple different examples. On the left is uh, a site on the Ohio River. The guy on the floppy hand happens to be me. And on the right you see a, a site that was occupied for less than 40 years, but changed hands three times between the uh, English, Dutch, and French. Battlefield archaeology differs from most other archaeology in that every item you find reflects the brief action of groups of individuals moving around in the middle of a battle across a much larger landscape than a house site or an indigenous village or anything like that. You know, the activity that you're looking at usually takes, took place within a day or less, often uh, just a few hours, even just a few minutes. And if the item is a fired bullet, that item reflects less than one minute of decision and action by a single individual. You'll actually see a couple points, a couple moments of that in this presentation. Uh, analysis of a single bullet will always tell you whether or not it was fired. Sometimes even whether or not it hit someone. There's actually been uh, blood residue found on some bullets from the War of 1812 on a different battlefield, obviously. Uh, but if you want to know which side was firing, you need to discover the pattern of bullets across broad areas of terrain. That discovery typically begins with a systematic program of metal detection, followed by careful excavation of each hit that the metal detectorist gets, uh, recording of the depth, because that can be an important issue, and a very, very precise, as much as you can do anyway, GPS record of each discovery location. What you're trying to find is you're trying to find where a bullet lands when it's fired at somebody, and you're also trying to find bullets that were fumbled and dropped when someone was loading their musket. That's followed by bagging and tagging, which is pretty typical of archaeology, with a unique ID number for each item, and recording of additional details, such as the type of artifact it is, a bullet or a horseshoe or whatever, and the material it was made out of, which typically in metal detection is going to be metal, <laughs> obviously. Um, there you see Dr. McBride, by the way, on the right, <coughs> doing some recording of the musket ball that you see on the left. The dark spot on that musket ball is a, the base of a sprue from the uh, bullet mold, which you see on every one of these things. Um, all of that is followed by mapping, and this is like the first of the maps, uh, to see how the archaeological evidence fits into a broader analysis of tactics, terrain, and the written record, which uh, in this case is often contradictory and fairly vague. You know, people that were recording what happened in this battle, most of them were recording at second or third or fourth hand. There were only a few eyewitness accounts, and sometimes they just like a sentence or two. Um, this happens to show the north edge of the village that was at Riverside. Um, various types of artifacts that were there, both indigenous artifacts, things used by the indigenous people that were metal, European metal, and also bullets. Most of what they're looking for, what Kevin's people are looking for, is lead shot. That's typical of most battlefields in the musket period. Lead shot came in two basic size ranges. Uh, musket balls of a half inch to three quarter inch diameter. Uh, 51 of those were found, which was only 18% of the total that have been recovered so far. Uh, musket ball, there's been some recent studies that are pretty good. Uh, that have shown that there's about a 75% chance of hitting a standing man at 100 yards with a 17th or 18th century musket ball. That's if he's standing still, you're standing still, you're aiming carefully. <laughs> um, if he's closer to you, you have a better chance of hitting him. If he's running around or on horseback, or I think trying to ride away from you, the odds diminish dramatically. They also diminish if you've got a lot of big trees in the way, which was largely the case in this battle. Everybody in this battle was running around practically all the time. <laughs> so there weren't a lot of hits compared to the number of musket balls, but there were still enough hits that people really felt it. If you hit with a full side musket ball, by the way, you were pretty much dead or you were going to be crippled for life. Um, it's a big enough thing to get hit with that you do not want that experience. Um, 236 of the recovered shot, 82%, were what the soldiers understandably called small shot. Uh, a fifth of an inch to a half inch diameter. Those were fired six or eight at a time uh, for a buckshot sort of effect 
within 30 yards, which is pretty up close and personal. That tells you how this battle was fought. It was largely up close and personal. Um, drop shot, like you see on the top left, um, look almost like no. Um, as the name implies, it's somebody fumbling when they're trying to reload their musket under fire, probably. And instead of reaching down and hunting on for that musket ball while they're being shot at, they just pull another one out of their bullet pouch. That tells you pretty much exactly where that one person was standing, which is pretty cool. Fired shot almost looks beat up. As you can see, you could mistake those for pebbles easily if you just happen to look at them on the ground. They almost look beat up. They tell you approximately where somebody was standing when they were shot at, but they don't necessarily show you where the actual person was. You know, someone could have gone past them. Someone might have fallen short. Turning to the history, just a quick refresher. I know <coughs> Peter Thomas here did a presentation a couple of years ago on the militia's involvement in this battle, as well as a bloody book. But you know, some people probably missed that, and you know, everybody could stand a refresher once in a while. <coughs> um, 1675 was a really bad year for settlers in the valley. Northfield had to be abandoned, Deerfield had to be abandoned, about a third of Springfield got burnt down. Through the winter they were left with 150 dis pretty discouraged soldiers because they had been left behind while everybody else marched back to Boston <coughs> to protect all five surviving towns. Winter proved to be pretty calm, but by February there were towns under attack further east and they were just waiting for the next thing that would happen out here. They were really, really nervous about it. So it was with great relief that this rather elegantly dressed character, uh, Major Thomas Savage, arrived on March 8, commanding an army of 600 English soldiers and about 50 Mohican, Pequot, and Natick Indian scouts to reinforce the valley garrisons. Captain William Turner's brand new company of foot was one of the two sent to immediately protect Northampton. Um, where exactly one week later, they successfully helped to defend an attack by 500 to 1,000 depending on your account, uh, indigenous warriors who had managed to break through the palisade and were starting to burn down people's houses. And <coughs> they killed about, I think about a half dozen people and wounded a comparable number. Two soldiers killed. Uh, the rest were all civilians, including a 12-year-old girl. Anyway, the defense worked out okay. They were driven out uh, pretty good for a bunch of recent conscripts. Almost all these guys were what we consider draftees in uh, 20th century terminology, led by a commander who had just recently raised his company a month before, two months before, uh, actually one month before, less than a month before, um, who had never gotten higher than a sergeant in the militia. Two weeks later, they got a really nasty surprise, though, from the government <coughs> of Boston. <laughs> On April 7, actually a little bit before, the governor's council ordered Major Savage to immediately march his army back East, leaving Turner, who was his least, ex they specifically said to leave Turner, the least experienced commander, with no more than 150 soldiers, preferably all single young men whose deaths, and it was said this way, would not be much of a loss to the colony if they, something bad happened. Um, they also suggested that Hatfield, Northampton, and Westfield should all be abandoned, because 150 men wouldn't be enough to protect those towns. You can imagine the reaction that that got. Westfield actually tried to secede and become, become part of Connecticut. Uh, Connecticut was Connecticut because they had enough. They felt they had enough trouble on their own without picking up another town that was at risk. Uh, but anyway, it put a big scare into everybody that they, you know, everybody was feeling like they were just being abandoned. Uh, to his credit, Major Savage actually left her with 217 men, 67 men. Apparently, were completely off the books. I, I found this out just through my own research. Uh, they, they've been out here since the previous autumn, and, and it's like the, the governor's council had forgotten they were even here, apparently. They did eventually all get paid. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's kind of funny that they had been just forgotten that they were even here. So Savage and Turner apparently saw an opportunity to leave more people here than the governor's council wanted. Uh, which was probably a good thing. The new garrison company that was created out of this uh, was pulled out of five different companies that had marched east. Only about 20 men in it were from Turner's company. So almost everybody he was commanding now was a stranger. 
Most of those men were conscripts. Um, I could go, I could go into all kinds of stuff about them. Uh, generally poor young men, single mostly, not entirely, and a lot of them were the kind of people that the select board in their town kind of wouldn't mind if they didn't get back. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, I pulled out of five different companies. Every one of his eleven officers had just been a common soldier, what we now call a private only two months earlier. Not really the kind of people you want to send out to try to win a battle out in the woods. Uh, but that's what they ended up, some of them ended up doing. Um, having five dispersed towns to protect, separated by a river that, by a river that was completely unbridged at that time, Turner was expected by the governor's council to not take any risks. That was pretty obvious from their directions. Uh, but he, but to keep his men in garrison until a new army could be sent west to, you know, protect the towns better through the rest of the summer. Uh, and Turner was personally inclined to do that, I really believe that. There's, there's some people who say that he was all about going to the falls, and he seems to have been kind of dragged reluctantly as out of a sense of duty. Uh, the local militia commanders were pretty desperate. They were afraid that there were going to be other attacks like the one on Northampton. So they came up with a far more aggressive plan, essentially an offense as the best form of defense, that sort of cliche. Um, there was a letter written to the governor's council on April 29. It's probably drafted by Reverend John Russell of Hadley, uh, who was a major promoter of the plan. <laughs> it's interesting that the, the clergy got really involved in all this kind of stuff. It was pure to New England, you know. The letter begins with a description of the indigenous gathering that um, and you know, basically gives you a quick outline. I'm cutting and pasting here, but it gives a quick outline of what they were planning. He said, above Deerfield is the great place of their fishing, which must be expected to afford them their provisions for the year. So that the swarm of them being here and like to continue here, we must look to feel their utmost rage, except the Lord be pleased to break their power. The enemy has now come so near to us that we can't, we might go forth in the evening and come upon them in the darkness of the same night. Now is the time to distress the enemy. Could we but drive them from their fishing, famine would subdue them. Pretty strong words, pretty determined attitude. <laughs> so, what actually happened? We know a lot more than we did just a couple of years ago, which is, which is pretty interesting, as you'll see. Captain Turner on sunset, just about sunset, May 18, the night of the planning moon, full moon, Captain Turner rides out of Hatfield with exactly 148 men. They begin in a road column, probably two horses wide, possibly wider, but I suspect that road was pretty narrow, and it had been abandoned since the previous autumn. Um, Turner was up front, just where he was supposed to be, with two local guides, experienced Hinsdale of Hadley and Benjamin Wade of Hatfield. <coughs> That was followed by Turner's garrison detachment, 62 men, not counting himself, uh, less than one third of the recently organized garrison company. All these guys were probably volunteers, but I'm kind of wondering, there's about 20 that don't seem to have any particular reason to have volunteered, and I began to wonder if they were volunteered by their garrison section, rather than actually doing it themselves, just to kind of fill up the number that was needed. Uh, they were led directly by an ensign Isaiah Tay, who was one of the few people left from Turner's original company. He'd been promoted twice by Turner. They may have been personal friends, and he was the next highest ranking officer, so he basically had to go. Uh, he was assisted by Sergeant Robert Bagwell, a pretty familiar name around here. He's the very first Bagwell around the valley. He was from London. Uh, he'd been in Boston in 1673. Um, he probably was drafted rather than volunteering, being a single young guy with no connections. He was the perfect target for uh, being drafted by a uh, press gang, basically. And uh, he undoubtedly volunteered because he had actually been in the valley since the previous autumn. He'd come out with a different company, defended Hatfield against an attack that autumn, and he'd fallen in love with a local girl. And the rest is Bagwell history. <laughs> <coughs> Next came the Hatcher County Militia Detachment, 
uh, 83 men, not counting the two guys that were up front, commanded by Lieutenant Samuel Holyoke at Springfield. He was only 20 years old, from a wealthy family, very well connected. Um, and he was assisted, in a religious sense, by Reverend Hope Atherton of Hatfield, uh, who served as chaplain. Um, whenever there was a major expedition by the Puritan Army, they almost had a chaplain with him, and he apparently, he was either their regular chaplain or he volunteered for it. Um, town contingents wrote as four separate groups, we actually know that from the record. 24 Springfield men under Quartermaster Nathaniel Foote, who was a pretty young man. Uh, 23 Northampton men under Ensign John Lyman, who I believe was 53 or 57 years old. He was in his 50s anyway. Um, you, you rose slowly and ranked in the militia. Um, there were nine Hatfield men and five more from Westfield, and my feeling is that those were probably combined because it was the weakest force of all. All under Sergeant John Dickinson, who <coughs> seems to have been actually a Hadley resident. Um, and 20 Hadley men under Sergeant Joseph Kellogg. Those surnames, I'm sure, are very familiar to a lot of people. There's street names all over the valley. Um, on the full moon light, they could easily follow the abandoned wagon road across Bloody Brook and on up through the ruins of Deerfield. Then through the North Meadows to cross the ford of the Deerfield River. After fording the Deerfield, they had to follow a foot trail through the forest. So they had to have changed to a single line of horses, which would have been nearly a half a mile long. Arriving at Factory Hollow, actually on the flat terrace above, they all dismounted, led their horses down some pretty steep swales that you'll see, you'll see later on um, into the hollow itself, tied the horses to several groups of young trees. At least 50 men were left to guard those horses. The, the rule of thumb was 10 men per, I mean 10 horses per man for horse guards in all the military manuals. Um, my feeling, I've changed my mind about this since uh, the report came out actually. I think now that they probably left Sergeant Dickinson with the nine Hatfield militiamen and the five men from Westfield. Also, Reverend Atherton probably stayed here rather than going right into the battle. That being the force that was exactly the right size for doing that, that's why I think they were the ones that were left. Or they would have had to divide up other ones. Uh, at first light, uh, as it's described when, uh, as soon as it was light enough to tell friend from foe in the records, uh, about 4.30 in the morning, May 19, the other 130 or so soldiers forded the Falls River and marched up over the west end of the glorified hill called Mount Pisgah in a 200-yard long column of twos, just like you see in that photo. At base of the mountain, the column swung right and was ordered to halt, then faced left. That turned the march column into two attack lines still 200 yards long and six feet apart in what was called open order in old manuals. They may have formed in a one line 400 uh, yards long. It's, it's difficult to say. There were a couple other possible formations, but they would have been both riskier. Um, Garrison detachment was now on the right end, whereas they had been in front, and the Hadley contingent was on the left. Muskets were shifted to a battle-ready posture, what you would now call the guard position, on guard, and the entire force marched south toward the village. The village consisted of an estimated 15 to 30 wigwams housing between 200 and 300 people. Perhaps 70 warriors from late teenage to middle age, 50 women of similar age, 150 or so young children, and maybe 30 elders, both male and female. Each wigwam housed eight to 15 family members of two or three generations, perhaps two to four men, two to three women, and four to eight children. If you showed up for breakfast at one of the smallest wigwams, you would have probably seen a family that looked a lot like this. Um, <coughs> nobody got to have breakfast that day, though. Most of those families were just waking up when the first shots were fired. What next to took place is really a massacre by any definition of the word. 150 minimum indigenous people were killed. Half or more of the population of the entire village. A minimum of a hundred of them were women and children, and at least 50 of them were warriors who died trying to save their families. Some of the survivors hid in the swamp, uh, probably right next to Barton Cove, probably underwater now. Uh, others escaped by canoe to a similar sized village in present-day Montague, Turner's Falls. 
The English lost only two soldiers wounded at that time and one killed by friendly fire when he stepped out of a wigwam, probably after killing everybody inside. It's been difficult for Cabot and his crew to identify the village in a, in a large sense because there's just a lot of metal there in the Riverside, several hundred years worth of metal that's later than the battle. And there's also a fair amount of ground disturbance from the house construction, factories that used to be there, lumber mills, all those kinds of things. But the north end of the village, they figure they've pretty much found where some of the wigwams were that were the first ones attacked. And those are just below the, uh, the rectangle. There's like a scatter of, of dots there, and those are the bullets that were found in that area. They were almost undoubtedly all fired by the English. And here's how we know that there was actually settlement, settlement right there. Uh, the upper right shows uh, lead that could be used to make lead shot. Uh, the lower left shows uh, brass and other materials that were largely used for making ornaments. Uh, the Indians were all about, uh, you know, having all kinds of jewelry. The Puritans didn't like jewelry. As soon as they understood what was happening, the war chiefs on the Montague side of the village began plans for a counterattack. So they realized that there weren't that many English people there, and they might be able to, to do something about the situation. They sent couriers to several smaller villages down the river as well. Um, most of the villages Turner didn't even know existed. He'd pass them by in the night, and he wasn't aware they were there. He'd have to pass them all again in his retreat. First counterattack came when 60 to 80 warriors began launching canoes from that south bank. English soldiers are now scattered all across the village, busily destroying everything of value to the enemy. Um, they burnt down the wigwams, uh, which might be able, might be something that could be found archaeologically with further work. Um, so they weren't really in a good position to defend themselves. They weren't expecting a counterattack. As soon as Turner became aware of the counterattack, he immediately ordered everyone to retreat back to the horses. Turner and the garrison detachment, as you may recall, have been at right end of the attack line, nearest to the falls, so we're now at the west end of the village, next to where the dam is basically now. And the 20 man Hadley contingent that had been on the left end was way up by Barton Cove. Because of that distance, those Hadley men seemed to have never got the retreat order, so kept firing at canoes until the first of them began to land. And then they began to work. <laughs> 23 small shot and five large musket balls were recovered between the village and Mount Pisgah. Most of all of those were probably fired at the militiamen. Those are inside the rectangle and a small area just above it, just below the slope of the mountain that you can see. Here's where it gets really like you see a moment in time. One small shot and one musket ball were fired considerably <coughs> east of all the others. The two dots way over on the right within the rectangle. Those were most likely fired by two warriors at a single militiaman who had fallen behind and was now seriously cut off from all the rest of them. Looking at that whole situation, how far away he is from everybody else, and also the fact that several small shot are not on the ground, uh, maybe they were at him, uh, it seems unlikely that that guy ever got home. Turner's men began heading back up the mountain and the firing at that point probably died down a bit because under the direction of some very crafty war chief, I wish I knew his name, uh, most of the warriors suddenly stopped firing and ran west to silently ascend the mountain out of sight of the retreating militia. They then followed its ridge top to conduct a flank attack at the crest. They knew the landscape. The English didn't know the landscape as well. Six ball shot and one musket ball were covered west of the trail and near the crest of Mount Pisgah. This is another one of those moments in time. Um, I should point out that the good guys are the blue arrows on all these maps, the English are the, in red. <laughs> <laughs> and these dots here are those musket balls, the ones that go past where the, where the blue guys were running up the mountain. The arrows show, show the path of people running. Two or more of the trailing militiamen must have spotted those warriors closing in on the left flank, and they both paused to fire a single shot at them, assuming there's only two. If only two shots were fired, it looks like they both missed, because you've got six small shot from one musket and one musket ball from another musket. 
but 46 more small shot and one more musket ball were covered in a 15 yard wide gap where the trail crosses the crest of the hill, the mountain. Uh, all of those were fired by the warriors executing their flank attack. That's that mass of dots right in the center of the map. Here's what it looks like on the ground. On the left you see the soldiers view as they were lining up the mountain. Uh, when I took this photo, I was coincidentally standing probably about where those two militiamen turned to fire at the people they saw running toward them about to start firing. On the right, you see the, the warrior's view from that flank attack. The English ran from right to left in that photo, just about halfway across the frame. There's general agreement that, you know, at least one or two of those militiamen were probably wounded or killed there. There's just so much heavy fire going on and it's a pretty close range. On the far side of the gap, there's another steep drop back down to the Falls River. Twenty-four small shot and four musket balls were found there on the slope. Uh, most of those were fired down at the fleeing militiamen who split into smaller groups, trying to make smaller targets of themselves as they ran, slid, and tumbled down the slope. Here you can see again the red is the, is the militiamen running away, and the blue is the pursuing indigenous people. And you can see there's just this mess of shots scattered around where people just took a shot at opportunity. Not all the firing was from the quest, though, which is kind of interesting. Three musket balls just below T in the word terrace, where there's also a little arrow, were fired upward from somewhere near the river bank. And one more musket ball plus two small shot were fired from the west bank at the bend of the river, hitting the east bank at the very bottom of the slope. So who fired those shots? And who were they firing at? The line of blue arrows coming up the river gives one possible clue. The English situation now taken another very bad turn. The nearest down river encampment, which had been alerted by the encampment in uh, Turner's Falls, it's now Turner's Falls, uh, was a palisaded village on Lawson's Island, uh, which I think is now Smeed's Island due to an error that the USGS made at some point. Uh, they reversed the, the two island names. Um, anyway, shortly before Turner's main force returned to the hollow, we don't know exactly when, about 30 warriors, maybe some more than that, but 30 men one might say, crossed over from that island, came up on the east side of Canada Hill, and began a firefight with the 16 or so horse guards. If Sergeant Dickinson was actually in command of those horse guys, this was probably when he was killed, I would think. Because uh, he was pretty well outnumbered and having to handle everything himself. Returning to the mystery shots that were fired down from down in the hollow upward at the hill, uh, the three musket balls that landed up on the slope seemed most likely to have been <coughs> fired by three of those warriors from Watson's Island, staying near the river bank while trying to shoot down the last of the Hadley men running at an angle more or less toward them. A uh, single musket ball and two small shot that hit close to the river bank seemed likely to have been fired, to my mind anyway, likely to have been fired by the Hadley men who finally reached the hollow, close range pounding shots at the Montague warriors that had chased them over the mountain. Third alternative is some sort of weird guard, but Turner had told 16 year old Jonathan Wells that he dared not wait for the other 19 Hadley settlers, saying better to lose some than lose all. English situation probably stabilized very briefly when Turner's main force reached the hollow, just because at that point they were now outnumbering their opponents. <coughs> but only long enough for all those men to frantically mount up. Must have been a real mess. At least a few horses were probably shot down while Turner's men were trying to mount. One at least lost a shoe. The one on the left that's very distinctively different from the more modern horseshoe you see on the right. Um, fair chance that that horse died a lot. You know, not only lost the shoe, but died there. Uh, another place where maybe a little bit more work might even find a horse bone or two. Uh, Hadley militiamen seemed to arrive just as Turner's main force was beginning to ride away. It seems Im it's impossible, pretty nearly impossible, I wouldn't say it's completely impossible, to accurately fire a musket from a running horse, uh, even a walking horse. It's, it's an awkward weapon and you know, you're not going to have any issues again, that, despite everything you see in movies. Uh, so from here to the Deerfield River, it seems unlikely that any of Turner's men were firing back. 
85 small shot and four musket balls were found in Fort Wales leading up to the north, back up to the northern terrace where they had dismounted in the morning. That's the greatest number in any one spot so far uh, that's been found. <coughs> All four of those swales are steep, so the horses could only ascend at a walk. Remember, they were led down. So, you know, somebody's on horseback, they're moving very slow up those swales. And all four of the swales show evidence of fire at the retreating horsemen. That's the four rectangles here. The one on the lower left, you can see there's a big concentration of shot hidden there. That's the heaviest concentration. Here's what that particular swale looks like. It's really steep. I, I was surprised that uh, you could even ride a horse at a walk up that, but Kevin McBride is also a horseman as well as an archaeologist, and he assures me that you could do it, but you could only do it slowly at a walk. Thirteen musket balls were found up on the flat terrace up at the top, but only six small shot, indicating that the warriors had now reloaded for long range to fire at the retreating horsemen, who could now finally outpace them. But they weren't all safe yet. Three musket ball concentrations circled, each with metal horse tack nearby, appeared to reflect three horses that were down. One or two of the three horsemen may have been rescued by comrades, the kind of thing you see in movies, you know, when somebody says, come on up, <laughs> and gets behind him. Uh, but it seems unlikely that all three of them managed to get away. Next counterattack was on the north edge of White Air Swamp. It almost seems to me that, that it was fairly nearly continuous, but we're not quite sure of that. Um, you could keep up with it, if you were wanting, you could keep up with these horses, and the only, thing, only reason that you couldn't keep up is that you had to stop and reload once in a while. So, you know, the English barely outpaced the indigenous people all through this retreat. Anyway, an ambush by, this was an ambush by additional warriors from Lawson's Island. At least that's what we suspect. Uh, quite a few of Turner's men were cut off here when their horses were killed or somebody else's horse was killed in front of them. Experience Hinsdale, the guide, <coughs> Uh, seeing no other alternative, led at least seven of those soldiers into a quieter part of the swamp, hoping to hide until the battle passed them by. None of those men ever got home again. No written record of any fighting along Cherry Run Brook, but four musket balls have been recovered there. I think the reason there's no record is the book didn't have a name at that time, so nobody knew what to call it. Those were all probably fired by indigenous warriors. Further research could probably reveal more. That was looked at on the very last day of the survey. You always find the most interesting stuff on the last day of anything <laughs> when it comes to archaeology. And that's what happened to Kevin and his crew. Uh, Green River Ford is where the most famous ambush occurred. And this was like a masterful piece of work uh, by warriors from a village near Cheapside. They were probably on both banks of the river. Uh, Captain Turner was shot in his thigh, then in his back, and fell off his horse just after reaching the south bank. He was identified as an officer by his behavior, his clothing, and his weapons pretty easily. He was asked his name by uh, a Narragansett named John Wikopiak, I think that's how it's pronounced, and probably then hit on the head with a war club. Uh, Lieutenant Holyoke's horse was shot and fell on its side. Another warrior ran up to try to finish him off. Holyoke had managed to get out from under his horse. He managed to roll off, I think, before the horse completely fell, uh, and shot the man down with a pistol. And then he mounted onto a new horse. There were probably a few empty horses there at that point, so it wasn't too hard to find one. Uh, as at Chiron Brook, there's no direct account of any fighting at the fort of the Deerfield River, but we'd all suspected there was probably fighting there, and it turned out we were right. Lieutenant Holyoke was now in overall command as he outranked uh, Ensign Taylor the garrison detachment. And the ambushes here were from also the area near Cheapside, maybe the same village as the other one, maybe a different village. There may have been two different villages there, we're not quite sure about that. You'll, you, you may notice that there's sort of a line going on there. I'll get to that in a minute. Most of the slope down to the deer field is uh, much too steep for a horse, as you can see on the left. Uh, the terrace on top is nice and flat, but boy, that's a steep slope. One narrow swale could be used single file at a walk, but that created a serious bottleneck. They found nine dropped musket balls, seven fired ones, and 14 fired small shot on the edge of the terrace. Also, two fired ones on the trail down to the river. Those were probably 
fired by indigenous people, the horsemen that were heading down the soil. Uh, the nine drop shot atop the terrace are interesting because they document that several soldiers must have dismounted to cover the crossing of the ford by the rest of the group. Uh, that's the sole evidence of any soldiers dismounting during the retreat. The men who dismounted seem most likely, to my mind anyway, they seem most likely to have been from the garrison detachment as they were the best trained and most experienced soldiers of the group, more so than the <coughs> local militia. They probably took very heavy casualties doing that, covering for the other people that were trying to get across. Um, here again you can see the difference on the left between dropped musket balls that look nice and round and fired ones that look like pebbles. <laughs> They look like a real mess. Some of them even basically cut in half. Uh, majority of surviving soldiers managed to stay off. I should point out that they, that one account says they were traced all the way down to where Byers Farm is now, approximately. Um, but that area hasn't been looked at yet. Um, anyway, the majority of soldiers managed to stay, who had managed to stay with Lieutenant Holyoke arrived in Hatfield sometime that afternoon. Dozen or so have been cut off at Green River Ford it arrived a little bit later under the guidance of uh, Benjamin White, uh, who later went on to do all kinds of amazing wilderness things. <laughs> he, was, he must have been quite a character. Reverend Atherton and Jonathan Wells both literally staggered in a day or two afterward after going through all kinds of horrific and strange experiences. And a, some, a few more men may have had the same sort of experience. Eight Englishmen who had become thoroughly lost, so in three days later in hope of a prisoner exchange, which had happened before in small, you know, occasionally, but not real often. Uh, they were instead burnt to death and revenge for all the murdered women and children. The butcher's bill, as the British expression went in those days, and later on in, in military history too. 37 of Turner's men, one of the 148, were killed. 27 wounded, which produces a total of 64 casualties <coughs> and a rate of 43 percent. Garrison detachment hit, was hit the hardest, probably because of them dismounting at the uh, Deerfield Ford. 21 out of 63, exactly one third, including Turner himself, and at least eight wounded that I've been able to disco discover through their uh, pay records, basically. If you were wounded, ordinarily, it was your last payday. Uh, 29 casualties at least, and a rate of at least 46 percent for the uh, attachment of what you would, we would have called the regular army in a sense. Uh, 16 of the 85 militiamen were killed, and if all the other 19 wounded were militia, uh, that makes a total of 35 and a casualty rate of 41 percent. Those are all pretty high, even for battles in those days. Um, but the one thing about this battle that differs from battles in Europe generally is that, you know, you couldn't easily put your hands up and surrender because neither side was really interested in taking uh, prisoners. Indigenous losses were more than twice the English, over 150 people killed in the massacre, at least two-thirds of them women and children, and about 30 warriors killed during the counterattacks, perhaps 20 more wounded. That's just a guess on my part based on the 30 killed. Um, they probably didn't, you know, they, they probably didn't lose nearly as many, they probably didn't lose a lot more than that because they weren't being fired back at very much. Um, the English, this is one thing I've been thinking about very recently. English call it a victory, but I found myself wondering whether it really was in the long term. Uh, Hatfield was attacked only 11 days later by an estimated 500 warriors, and Hadley was hit by 250 on June 12. So it didn't really immediately protect the towns. Uh, but an English expedition did go out on the 16th of June and found that everybody was gone from the falls. There were no indigenous people camped there anymore, and there were no more attacks in 1676. So in a sense, Reverend Russell may have been right. You know, they were short of food and felt they just couldn't stay around there. They were also really low on gunpowder and probably lead shot as well at that point. Um, and you, you can't keep a battle, you can't keep a war going without gunpowder in those days. So they, they ended up splitting up into smaller groups and the war eventually sort of 
trickled away. It didn't end until 1678 up in Maine. Uh, and locally, in late 1677, Hatfield was hit with a French-supported raid by refugees, the Comtucks, uh, non you know, local tribes, who had fled up to Canada in the aftermath of the war. Next Indian War began only 11 years later, and there wasn't really any peace in Western Massachusetts until 1760. Oh. So, yeah, was it worth it to the, to the English to have even gone there? Would they have been better off just keeping everybody in garrison until the Relief Army showed up? It's an interesting question, and I don't have the answer. That's it. <laughs>